Welcome to Poker Hands Dissected number four. For those of you who are new to this, this is where we basically dissect a thought process that was submitted to us by a poker player. So a player submits his thoughts or her thoughts around a hand and we're looking to dissect that process. The reason why is most hand dissections focus too much on the actual hand. We're more concerned with the process so that we can see that a player can have repeated results and repeated thinking in certain spots and at the poker table. So let's take a look at this hand. Okay, so we start off with a little bit of a description about our opponent. And it says the main opponent is an active and sticky player who seems to like to take aggressive actions when other players in the hand show him weakness. Okay, so maybe, you know, we have some sort of back and forth or some sort of read that this player has on this player. And he uses the term active and sticky. For those of you who don't understand what those terms mean, uh, active tends to just mean plays a lot, right? They're active, loose, however you want to kind of classify it. And sticky player usually means that they like to, kind of think of it this way, they, they stick to certain flops. So they're likely to stick around, right? Sticky, stick around kind of connects. Now, I really want to call out the usage of terms because I speak about this several times throughout the Poker Hands Dissected series, the Wednesday Workout series. Terminology or language is very important in poker. If my definition of what sticky is different than your definition of sticky, we can have some issues when I'm trying to help you with certain lines or certain things that you're doing in the game. I think language is one of the most effective ways to improve, but you need to get that language correct because the language is the building blocks of the bigger thinking. It's kind of like uh, the language in any scope, any area of learning, and not just poker. But he seems to like to take aggressive actions when other players in the hand show him weakness. So maybe this is the kind of player that just will attack basic indications of weakness. And it's some sort of information that our opponent has on his player. So cool to start off with some sort of background information or data. So we have pocket sixes in the big blind. We get a caller and a raise. All right, so the student's why is there's a $5 call from a passive middle position player with 575 behind them, and the aggressive player from above makes it 25 from the button. I am the big line with sixes and call. Middle position player calls as well, and we go three hand into a flop with 77 in the pot. All right, so I'm, this is the passive player, this is the aggressive player, and we call. Okay, so pocket sixes in the big blind against an aggressive player on the button, fine call, don't really have that much commentary here. If you wanna talk about the natures of playing mid pairs against certain players or small pairs against certain players, a lot of players will have a difficult time playing mid pairs and small pairs out of position against any kind of aggression, just simply because if they don't flop a set, it, they kind of kill the hand. So you have to really factor in the equation of Obviously, you know, the standard basic implied odds kind of scenarios of if I call here and I do flop my set, am I likely to make more money over time? But also take into consideration the fact that what is the attributes of my opponent? So sometimes players will like make these calls with you know, set mining or trying to flop a set, well, but they don't realize is their opponent's like the tightest player in the world. And they're very rarely actually going to take that bet, bet, bet line against you when you flop a set. So you gotta, you gotta just make sure that that's not an issue. But the fact that this player is aggressive and the fact that this player has a sticky component to his game and we have that data makes calling great. It also makes calling great that we have this, you know, uh, more passive player that's likely gonna come, uh, likely gonna come along. So I don't have any problems with calling out of position with pocket sixes in this dynamic. It's, it seems fine. Flops four, six, seven, we bet, and let's look at this why. So, I decide to lead into the semi-wet flop for a weak looking $40 bet. I decide on a small lead bet in this spot because I believed I could get a call from the passive middle position player and maybe a raise from the button. I also think this is a board that the button may decide to check behind if we both check to him. Heads up with the button, I may have leaned more towards a check call or check raise on this flop. Unfortunately, the middle position player folds and the button calls the $40 bet. I mean, it's pretty, this is pretty good logic. Uh, I I definitely think, I, I wanna caution some of you here. Um, I did this cool thing where I would ask players to tell me what they would do in certain spots, right? And what I would do is I would use a stopwatch. So I'd like put like a 20 or 30 second stopwatch. And I'd be like, you got 20 seconds, tell me what you would do. 
And they would be like, bet. And I'd be like, why? And they'd be like, well, and they kind of like think it through and think it out. And they'd give me a reason. And then I'd give them five or six minutes to give me the reason why they did something. And they would give me this like really articulate answer that had like multiple threads to it. And like, oh, I could do this because of this. I could do this because of that. It's a big difference between practical application of what you would actually do at the table and how we're seeing players break down why they did what they said they did in the hand. Meaning there sometimes is disconnect between this and what you're actually thinking about at the table. It's a really important thing. I, I see a lot of players who've done so much study on their game work, study, 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 talk about, oh, this is the most optimal play in this spot and blah, 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 when they've had like 30 minutes at, with the actual hand. You really wanna make sure that you really work on making sure that those two thought processes get connected. It's like one of the things we do in my predictive edge course is really trying to get people's thought process at the table to be similar to how, you're never gonna get as good in post analysis, like everybody can sound like a poker genius in post, but it's the actual rationalization when you're playing. So you really want to think about how close your thought process is when you're sitting down playing poker than when you're studying or when you're posting comments or you're you know, talking the hand over with friends because it creates an issue where people, I've seen some people like have really, you know, not such great results, but look on paper to be such good players. And I'm kind of like, hmm, like what's going on here? So I'm not saying this player is doing that. And in fact, this player is pretty good. I, I, I know them, but like, uh, be careful for that. Watch out for that. Whenever I see these long-winded answers, I'm just kind of like, uh, actually applying that in a real game. So let's get into it. But this is fine logic. I don't think that there's anything really wrong here. Um, he is using the justification of knowing his opponent a lot. And based on what he said about his opponent, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's just I could question... The, how does he know that about his opponent? So where do those inferences, you know, that stickiness or he's going to attack weakness or like, where does that come from? Does it come from playing one or two hands from him? Does it come from the fact that he's got a certain kind of sweater on and you think people with certain kind of sweaters or some sort of weird kind of like rationalization and the reason why? And I see that sometimes. Like sometimes people have really good reasons for doing things, but the foundation, the reason's good. But the information they use to make that decision or make that decision is kind of coming from a bad source. But we're going to take his word for it. And I think this is, there's nothing wrong with making the small bet. And I think this dynamic works enough time to be profitable and is, is a good way of getting value. All right. So king on the turn, students why? All right. So king on the turn, students why? Turn comes the king of diamond and I decide to check. I felt that the king might be a perfect card to check and allow the button player to represent as hitting his range. The button makes a rather large bet of 125. At this point, I felt like I had two viable options. I could just call and continue telling the story that my hand is some sort of middling pair and or draw type hand, or I could elect to check raise and announce my intention to play this pot for stacks. I decide to just call and reevaluate on the river. Again, clean logic. I do believe that uh, for the most part, so this is the thing. We, we want to classify like stickiness and aggression. So one of the things I really like to always figure, I call it thought spikes. And I've talked about this in so many other videos, like our videos inside School Cards and Beyond Tells, that like players have this, they, they think, right? They're not thinking that much pre-flop. They're acting out of instinct. Then all of a sudden, like sometimes, like on the turn, the pot gets big enough and they're like, boop, and it, they, they start to spike in their thought. And they start to really think like, all right, does this guy have a hand that beat me? They're like kind of in autopilot mode and they spike. And sometimes we have that with sticky players, right? So this could be the kind of player who, you know, is very aggressive pre-flop, sticks to a lot of flops. And then all of a sudden, if he has some sort of resistance or meets some sort of aggression post-flop on like on the turn or something like that, he tends to shut down. This is like one of the, a lot of live players to this day still do that at like 2-5 and 1-2 really aggressive, really tough pre-flop and post-flop, and their turn in river game is just they just stop thinking and they shut down. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, so he's basically, assuming that this player is not that, like assuming the player that, that the opponent is going to like that king, right? And obviously, like he says, you know, he likes card, he bets out there with a wide range of hands. And that by just calling, he plans to take more, plan, on average, you know, could make more money as opposed to um, check raising in this spot. I think that's fine too. I, I definitely like, I think the calls here, the call here is great. I don't see a, a problem with that. I agree with basically what's being said here. It's fine logic. Again, the only thing I'm challenging is if you're actually thinking at this level at the table, um, just because this is a lot of thoughts to just like condense. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is, 
good thinking play, poker. Um, four clubs, check. Okay, so we check. Our opponent jams and we obviously call. Now let's look at this logic. River comes a four of clubs. The board now reads, we know what the board is and I hold six. The pot is now 407, I have 510 left. Given my read on my opponent as likely to take aggressive actions when opponents show him weakness and his rather large turn bet, I decided to check to him and allow him to hopefully bet this river. I do check and he shoves for his remaining 455. I immediately call and he shows us the ace king and I take in the pot with my full house. Okay, so a couple things. First, you know, this is the one hand where I really don't have a problem with the logic. The past three hands that we've gone over, I've kind of been really nitpicky. I think this is all fine. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. This is a good thought process. Uh, as I said before, we want to question this whole ration, this whole thing around where you get the information from. And also, are you actually thinking like this at the table as opposed to post analysis? But this player, I think, is thinking like this. But a couple things is that like, yeah, you know, not really, like also, it's kind of like, it doesn't mean, it's not one of those hands where it's like, wow, this was played so amazing. Like you flop the set against a really aggressive player out of position, like, you know, it's still it's still kind of easy an easy way to play the hand like this is not like really a complicated hand but i just want to say that it was played well i i do think that the reads came to fruition you just got to make an argument in these dynamics that if you're saying this aggressive player made a large turn bet and now all of a sudden i think that they're going to actually you know jam a lot of rivers because they tend to prey on weakness and my check will be perceived as weakness this is all incredible high level great poker and the kind of poker that i love to play where there's someone in front of you and you could exploit them and you can really take into consideration how their consideration is that even work take into consideration how they're approaching the game and use that to your advantage it's great poker but you just got to make sure that's actually really what's occurring and you can't create these dynamics for yourself that are not actually exist existing i'm not saying that this player is doing that but i've seen a ton of players do that so like, yeah, he's really aggressive and he's going to bet most flops. And it's like, eh, he's not really aggressive and he's not going to be betting most flops. So yeah, that exploitive style and that way of approaching poker really, really works if you're right on your reads. And that's kind of what it is to play live poker. And that's what's so um, beautiful about it is that you can get that information where online you can't get as much of that data. So yeah, pretty straightforward hand. I think it was very interesting. Any other questions or comments? post below uh sign up for our poker hands dissected a uh, little workshop where i show you how to dissect a hand and kind of criticize it and then ask for you to submit a hand we give you some feedback so link and information is below see you next week if you enjoyed the video make sure you subscribe we are releasing between two to three videos every single week also make sure you head over to schoolofcards.com value the links below in the description it's basically our value email list where I, I do random webinars for free once or twice a month. I also answer questions, submit hands, and we release videos that we don't always release on YouTube. So make sure you check out schoolcards.com slash value, enter your name and email, and I'll keep you up to date.